Hello, everybody. Welcome to the world of 2D, 3D hybrid animatics. The focus of this tutorial will be about utilizing Blender's fantastic Grease Pencil 2D tool in combination with the 3D environment and 3D camera work in order to create 2D, 3D hybrid animatics, storyboards, and animation, like the examples shown here. Before we dig in too deeply, here are a few tips for UI and navigation. Okay, so the first thing to do is if you're going to be using your Cintiq with your with your pen, uh, I advise changing the settings a little bit. So if you set up a profile in the Wacom tablet properties, so add a plus here, and you can see I've made a blender one. If you look at the difference between, you've got right click and double click, uh, and if I click that, I've changed it to middle click, right click. So what that does is it makes the first button into the middle click, which is the same as um, the middle click button on a mouse, which is essentially your main pivot. Another really efficient setting to change is tab for Pi menu. So I'm going to edit preferences, and then in the key map section, in the center there, you'll see tab for Pi menu. If you click that on, that basically means every time you want to switch a mode, like from draw mode to edit mode, to object mode, which you'll be doing a lot. You just press tab and this little radial menu comes up. You flick your your, um, your pen or your mouse in whatever direction you want and you're there instantly. It's really good, helps the workflow. Basic navigation in the viewport. Hold shift and middle mouse button to pan up and down, left and right. Hold control and middle mouse button and push in and out to zoom in and out. To pivot around something, hold the middle mouse button and move around. We're currently pivoting around the cursor point, which is on the barrel. If you press N to bring this tab up on the side of the viewport here, select the view tab and click lock to 3D cursor. Hold shift and right click to move your cursor to anywhere in 3D space, and it will begin pivoting around that point as we are on the bricks here. If I continue to use shift and right click to move the cursor to various parts of the environment, you can see that the pivot point changes. This is great for navigation in the viewport. Example scene one. This will be the main tutorial segment and focus on the scenario being displayed above. We'll cover everything from setting up objects, basic grease pencil principles like brushes, materials, orientation modes. We'll also cover things like keyframing, setting up cameras and keyframing those, and then how all that fits together. If you are already familiar with a lot of these principles, like setting up the grease pencil object, orientation mode, drawing, brushes, layers, you can skip ahead to the layout section of this first scene. I will make a note of the time code in the description below. How to create objects and specifically grease pencil object. Okay, so wherever your cursor is, if I press shift and A, it will bring up this menu. Now you can go to mesh and you can create say a cube or a circle or a UV sphere. I'll do that to demonstrate. And there it is, it will come in exactly on that cursor. But we're not looking to make a UV sphere at the moment. We're looking to make a grease pencil object. So in order to do that, you do the same thing. Shift and A to bring this menu up. Grease pencil. Now you can either make a blank or a stroke. The difference is that if I make a blank, it will, it will simply be blank and have no information whatsoever. If I make a stroke, it has this stroke here that you don't really want, but the advantage being it actually gives you two layers <clears throat> already over here on the right in the grease pencil option, and it gives you a bunch of materials pre-baked in. So it kind of is easier to, to use that, I guess, to start with. You don't have to. I tend to use blank and then make, make my own materials. But we'll stick with the stroke for this demonstration. So once you have created your grease pencil layer, um, the really clever thing about Grease Pencil is that it's essentially a 2D animation layer of m as many drawings as you want contained within a three-dimensional object. And because it's in object mode here, <coughs> because it's an object, you can move that through the environment to any position in three-dimensional space that you want to, which is why <coughs> the stuff that I've done works the way it does in that I lay it out as a three-dimensional object but the grease pencil is still a drawn element. Now we'll take a look at draw mode, canvas orientation, and a grid to help locate where we are. On the screen right now, you'll see there's a grid displayed behind the stroke. That's because I've switched on the canvas. You can find the canvas option via this little switch up here. The drop down menu comes down. As you can see, here's the canvas, switch it on. 
And over on the right there, you'll see you can actually change the color of that grid. You can also change the scale of the grid, both on the X and Y axis. You can also move it on the X and Y axis, and you can change the number of subdivisions. The canvas is really great for knowing exactly where you are in 3D space and the orientation which you're drawing from. So let's take a look at these orientation options. So the main one that I use is origin and view. Now at the top there, you can see those two at the middle there. You can change those and there's various settings. We'll go through each of them, but the main one I use is orientation view. Uh, and as you can see, when I'm drawing, it, it draws whatever angle the camera is facing. So it's as if the canvas is sort of attached to the camera and wherever you turn, that's where you draw in space. That's because of the view setting. The reason that we're kind of sticking in one space and kind of rotating around is because I've set origin. Origin means that wherever your object is or the origin of that object, that's where the center point stays. So sticking with origin, I've switched to front XZ orientation. As you can see now, when I start drawing here, it's as if there's a flat wall on that axis at the origin point. And you could just draw on whatever angle you're drawing from in the viewport, it's always just gonna draw on that flat plane to infinity. The next option is side YZ. And this does the same thing, but on the opposite axis. And the reason it's kind of side and front to kind of switched here is just because the way my scene is orientated. It might be different in the way you've set your scene up. So as you can see, it's continuing along that axis to infinity again. Next option is top X, Y. And as you can imagine, it means you're drawing from a top orientation. So everything you draw now is gonna be flat down, basically. It's gonna look like it's flat down. Because my origin is on the ground, it's gonna draw on the ground. If I was higher up, it would draw like on a floating plane, but still flat. So now let's take a look at the cursor mode. So this would replace the origin mode. Now, remember before, if we hold shift and press right click and move the cursor around the environment. See the little cursor, the little 3D cursor there? Okay, so that acts now as kind of the origin point. Um, and if you draw up, because we're on the, um, the front axis, if I just keep drawing up here, wherever that cursor is, it'll draw up from it. So I'm drawing a couple of very basic little stick men here. Um, and something that's really useful to do with this kind of workflow is to plan out your scene. You could kind of, you know, dot your little stick man along. You can actually animate using this as well, this kind of feature. Um, or you can just draw out the various elements that you want to draw in the scene, you know, even if you're not going to animate them. This is just a great way of getting around the place. But you'll notice that there's no canvas showing up behind the origin point. But now there is because I switched it to cursor in the second sentence. So it's kind of, whereas before we were on origin front, now we're on cursor, cursor. And that's where, um, wherever your cursor is now, the actual canvas will show up there as well. The next setting is a personal favorite of mine, and I think you're gonna love it. Uh, it's called surface mode, and this is pretty awesome for various different reasons. As the name would suggest, it means you draw on the surfaces in the environment. Now you don't actually have to click your cursor on it or anything, I just kind of do it habitually. But as you can see here, I'm just drawing literally on the surface and it's sticking to it. I'm not telling it like that's where it has to go. It's just, it knows wherever you're drawing, it'll stick to whatever object is in front of it. Now you can see it's kind of clipping through a little bit here. So um, I dial up that setting that's underneath it uh, and I'll push the grease pencil in an offset slightly above it or, or below it, however you want to do it, right? But um, you just give it that little bit of an offset and you don't get any of that clipping anymore then. So as you can see, that's reading really clearly on there now. So you can pop around the scene and there's some bricks there. Um, so let's draw some little details on the bricks. This is absolutely fantastic for um, adding detail to 3D objects in the scene and giving it that lovely hybrid look. You know, you've got 3D objects and then you're drawing on it with 2D. Um, it's also very, very useful for drawing out floor plans. So if you, if you want to plan something out, just go into a top-down view, draw a diagram out, and then continue building a scene from there. The last main mode here now is stroke mode. And this is quite a weird one, but it's, it's got some really cool applications. It kind of uses existing grease pencil 
strokes, sort of like geometry, and you can kind of pull off them, branching off the strokes that exist already. So this can be really good for doing things like uh, trees, drawing trees or like vines that go between objects. It's got some really interesting uses. So let's take a look at the standard brushes we've got. So there's a variety here. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you can experiment with them. So we've got a nice fat one. Um, we've got a nice inky one. It's my favorite for cleanup. It's really nice when you play with the settings a bit on this. Uh, if you ever need to increase or decrease the size of the brush, hold F and then use your cursor to make it bigger or smaller. Uh, that one's a really nice one, the noise one. It's got a nice inky rough feel to it. <laughs> That's a linear, really linear brush. And then we've got one that looks kind of like pencil or is edging more towards that kind of natural, like with a bit of opacity on it. That's nice for doing roughs. There are various other options at the top here. Um, so we've got advanced, which has got like various smoothing options. Then we've got stroke and we've got curves, which uh, determines like thick and thinness, pressure sensitivity. So here I'm going to draw a very simple, super simple 2D man. And I'll use him in the project to come. Uh, so over on the right here, you can see I've got a grease pencil layer. Uh, so just the one layer at the moment because I created a, a blank grease pencil for this. And I'm just drawing this super, super simple dude here. It's not a good drawing, but it'll do for now. Um, so as you can see, as I got to the bottom there, uh, I've actually clipped into the floor because I haven't anticipated the floor correctly. So I just switched quickly to object mode so I can reposition the, the uh, grease pencil object so it's more in line with where the, where the floor matches up. Uh, now, just me using the pie menu. Uh, remember to use it, it really does save time. I always forget. So back into draw mode now to uh, finish off the legs. So now that I've done the line mark work on that particular layer, I'm going to create a new layer so that I can use it for my fills. So over on the right here in the grease pencil options, you press plus to create a new grease pencil layer and then use the arrows to push that layer up and down. Put it underneath for now because fills need to go underneath. So in the options there, you can click stroke and fill. I've set the color to be the same. Now, as I go around doing an outline, it's sort of like filling it in as it goes. Uh, continue to do that. You can let it go. You can do it in bits and bobs and it kind of all joins together until you've got your fill layer. And that's pretty much it for the, the basics of how you create a layer and then how you create a fill. And I'll be using this super simple man as the basis for the next stages of the tutorial. Super quick bonus round here on the sculpt and edit modes. You only use these near as much as object and draw mode in this, but they are useful. So edit mode allows you to manipulate all of the vertices within a grease pencil um, object and stroke. So you can use all your transformation tools, rotation, scale, etc. Um, this is really good for Let's say, let's say you've done drawing and you want to just kind of manipulate the scale of a particular portion of it, you can use that. Sculpt mode, similarly, is very cool. You get to manipulate it in a really organic way, as you're seeing right now. Uh, you can push and pull the shape. It's really cool. So that concludes the basic uh, introduction and fundamentals of the grease pencil object and draw mode. So now we can really dig in and do a step-by-step -step of how we go about laying out something like the scene we're seeing above. So we've made our grease pencil object uh, and we've got our simple man. So now we can start moving that around the 3D space to begin our layout stage of the process. So remember, we're still in object mode for the time being and we'll be here for a while as we block things up. So here again, we have our 2D artwork, which is contained within a three dimensional object, okay, within 3D space. So that means we can move it about, position it within 3D space and therefore lay it out just like you would any 3D object. So now we want to move our object to the start position of whatever path that we want the action to take. So move it, and I want to keyframe it, press I, that'll bring up a drop down menu. In that drop down menu, you want to select lock rot scale. And that means location, rotation, and scale. All of that will be contained within the keyframe. So uh, that's where it is, uh, what orientation it's rotated to, and the scale of the object. So to create my second keyframe now, I move the uh, along in the timeline, I move to 40, press I, lock rot scale again, 
there's my second keyframe and now you can see it's animating for me. Just like this is how you animate objects in any 3D application. But this time we have a 2D piece of artwork within it. And now I'll move my position again, move the timeline again, create a new keyframe. And you can just keep doing this to plot out the, the path you want to take. An alternative way of actually moving your object around the scene is to use the cursor mode. So if you position your cursor somewhere with shift, right click, and then you hold shift and S, you'll have a radial menu come up and select the top, which is selection to cursor. And it will actually pop to that place in the 3D space. Then you can key it. Then you can move your cursor again, shift S, selection to cursor, pop. You know, you need to pop it up sometimes as well. Iframe it, done. So you can just plot out your whole path that way too. I find this way of moving things around the scene uh, really, really useful. So as we briefly touched on earlier about surface mode, they can be really good for do doing floor plans. So what I'm doing now is I've just created a new blank grease pencil object and I'm going to select uh, surface mode. And uh, in doing so, I'm just going to draw a, a kind of rough path on the floor as to where the action that I'm intending to uh, demonstrate here is going to go. So I'm going to take him towards those bricks and back around in that kind of arc. So that just gives me a, a visual guideline of where I want the object to be animated. Uh, it's, it really is just a guide. <clears throat> so here I've keyframed the character in, in, on the first keyframe and I moved along. I'm using the cursor mode as demonstrated to jump to that position, pop him up so he's feet level of flat, keyframed, move the cursor, uh, sorry, move the timeline, then move my cursor to the on top of the bricks. Uh, then I'm using the cursor mode to pop him to that position. I've accidentally created a duplicate here because I pressed Shift and D. Uh, you'll have to forgive me that trespass and I will delete him in a moment. Um, so yeah, you just keep going. You keep moving the character along and the timeline along and cre creating a keyframe each time uh, so that you have the character move along the path that you want them to. So to me, this is one of the things that really drew me to Blender. I've been looking for a workflow that allowed me to do something like this for a very long time. I'm literally moving around the 2D objects in 3D space, genuinely, just like it would be if I was using a 3D object in 3D space. And uh, there are other softwares that kind of do this sort of thing, but not to this degree. The flexibility this gives you because everything is independent from one another is just unparalleled as far as I'm aware of. Um, and now that we've, uh, you can see here, the keyframes are all in, you can see the, the, um, the path is quite smooth. So that'll do for our layout path for the object segment of this. And now we can actually get in and start drawing some rough character layers into the grease pencil layers. As demonstrated earlier, I'll make a new grease pencil layer now for my sort of rough animation layer on top of this. Um, so I've selected the black um, material and I'm just grabbing a brush here now and just really roughing out, blocking out uh, basically human form running in a, in a kind of leaning forward kind of position. The artwork on this one's going to be really loose. You'll see uh, much tighter artwork in the uh, final examples that I use in a little while. So um, once I'm done with that one, I move the timeline to the next position that I want to make. Now remember, you don't have to move the object anymore. That's all done, right? So as soon as you start drawing, you see a new keyframe pops up and it blanks the artwork that was already on it. And you're like, ah, shit, where did that go? I am going to reference point now. There's no onion skin happening here. So in order to get the onion skin, there's a few settings you have to click on. One is on the actual grease pencil layer itself. It's like a multiple circles thing. And then the other bit is in this menu that's dropped down here. You have to click on onion skin. And you can also change the opacity of um, the other layers. And down on the right there, as you can see the green and blue, that's the color of your previous and next keyframes. So you can change that so that you, like you can see right now that the previous keyframe is green. So I've moved him along again now, and I'm gonna start drawing the next thing. And you see it blanks it, but you can still see the previous panel now because the onion skin is on. And you can have, um, you can change the settings again so it actually shows, you know, let, let's say you've done six previous panels, you can see all of, you'll be able to see all of those if you want to. 
I just don't need to right now. So I moved it along again, doing my next little sketch as he starts to kind of jump towards the bricks. Again, super loose. At this stage, don't even think about doing good artwork. This is literally layout and it's not, you're never going to clean this stuff up anyway, right? Because this is literally like a layout pass. Uh, once you get into choosing your camera angles, it's once you've kind of locked down your camera angles, then you want to bother with like really refining what the artwork looks like from the angle you're now kind of committed to looking it through. Right now, stick men, star men, scribbles, continuous line drawings. That's how I work when I'm at this stage. Anyway, I'm just scribbling shit down. <laughs> So there's a the leg trying to like kind of contact with the top of the uh, the bricks there for him to kind of just momentarily kind of skip over it. You just keep feeling this stuff out. Keep moving the position. As you can see, you just move it and you stand and you draw and it just creates the next keyframe on the timeline. You don't have to like click I or anything like that in Grease Pencil. It's all automated. So uh, that's that's really cool. So if you don't draw like the next pose, for instance, it just kind of holds the previous position and slides it along. I will demonstrate later how to not have it slide and to have it step. If you prefer that, you'll see the difference later. But for now, I'm just going to leave it sliding. That's called linear interpolation. The option, the other option is constant interpolation, which is what I refer to as stepped. So yeah, still sketching him out here, um, and we're almost done for this like for this for this layer. That's that's all the purpose of this is just to block out a really rough form, so that we can see how it looks when we scrub back through it. So let's take a look. So that is in essence the very very basis of what I'm doing here. It's a 2D multiple panel storyboarder animation. Uh, within a 3D object that is moving through space. Genuinely moving through space. And therefore you have all this, you can see right now in, in the viewport, the flexibility you've got to already start playing with right now, what camera angles should I choose to actually refine this from? And it works to a relatively flexible degree. It doesn't really break until you get right up on top of it or you go really high or really too far. So look, look at this flexibility you've got here to just think through scenes. It's just great. I love it. It gives us 2D artists the kind of flexibility that 3D artists have when they're doing layout. You know, they kind of lay out the animation and then they're looking, or they, or they have the opportunity at least, to just play with cameras after the animation's done. Um, whereas when we draw a storyboard or, or an artwork and then someone goes, oh, could we try it from you know, 20 degrees around to the right, you know, and then you just have to redraw it all or, or repurpose what you can. And, but this is just the flexibility you get here is insane. So at this point, I'm, I've am i created a new grease pencil layer on top again now, and it's a, you know, like a semi cleaner, a slightly better drawing. It's still not going to be great. So don't expect to be impressed. Um, whenever I'm recording, the lag is insane. So I'm just kind of laying in some basic lines and stuff here. Um, just to demonstrate that this is the process, right? So you've done your really stinking rough, like, um, you know, your scribble layer, your, your, your layout pass, and now you're, you're doing something a little bit more refined so that, you know, you, at least you can read it a bit better. Or um, So if you had done a really confident rough the first time around, or even now you were doing a really confident rough, then you would repeat this process by creating a new layer again, and that would be your cleanup layer. And then you start cleaning it up, making it look lovely. And then you can add your fill layers. Uh, you can add any effects layers. You can, you just keep going, you can keep going. I mean, it's blended grease pencil is a fully fledged um, 2D animation um, tool. You can make absolutely gorgeous artwork with it, especially with the, with the new uh, Vertex paint that's just come out. Um, I haven't tried that yet, but the, the results of that are beautiful. Um, so again, I'm just moving it along. I'm just cleaning it up. Uh, be careful. What you need to be careful of, though, is go to make sure you go to the next keyframe before you then draw your new thing, because otherwise your cleanup layers will be kind of out of sync with your rough layers. So you just go along to the timeline to the keyframes that's already there, and then draw. Um, if you actually press up and down on the 
the arrow buttons on your on your laptop or your, your computer, um, that'll jump to the next keyframe on that layer. Um, it kind of doesn't do it, unfortunately, until you've actually got a keyframe on it. So it's it's a little difficult, but essentially just rub along to the next keyframe and then draw. Okay, so we've uh, we've set up our, our grease pencil object in Spaces layout. We've animated a couple of rough panels so that it continues the action across the scene. Uh, so now it's time to start looking at those angles and getting some cameras set up. So you create a camera in the same way you create anything else is you hold Shift and A and then you roll down the camera and one will pop up in the scene. There's already one by default in any scene in Blender and to get into that you just press zero. So once you're inside it, you can actually manipulate the position of the camera. In order to do that, in the draw, on the tab menu we've got here, you click on the uh, lock camera to view setting. If that is off, you kind of um, you can you can choose how far up the framing of the camera is. Right, it kind of goes in and out. Whereas if you put it on, you actually control the camera and the framing stays the same. Once you've got that setting on, you are essentially controlling the camera from within this viewport. To create keyframes for the camera, make sure the actual camera is selected. It'll actually go orange around the outside of the frame you can see there. I've created one keyframe at the beginning. I've moved now to another keyframe, created that. So now you can see the camera's animating. It's the same principle for everything. You create a start keyframe, you create an end keyframe, and then it fills the rest in for you. So I'm just kind of tweaking here. I'm changing the camera angle a little. <laughs> Very briefly about camera settings and lenses. On the bottom right here, you can see I've switched uh, the settings to horizontal and 24 millimeters. And then at the top here, this is our actual field field of view uh, or our, uh, um, our lens length. So uh, lower the number, the wider the lens, the more you actually fit into the framing so you can get big, wide, dramatic compositions. It tends to distort then if you get close to things. Uh, long lenses are higher numbers and the long or narrow lens, some people call them, and they push uh, things together. So you kind of compress the space. So if you're looking for like really intense close-ups between two characters and a long lens works really well for that. Or if you want a big, massive vista, you know, you might want a wide lens. Um, just experiment with it. All right, so let's get back to our main example here um, of the, uh, the lady running and jumping over the barrels with the guy chasing her. So you can see the top down view compared to the camera view there. So with this instance, so this is one I made earlier, obviously, um, I that was the equivalent of Super Simple Man for this version. So I'm, as you can see, I've pathed out the scene. I'm, I've chosen the camera. I've animated the camera. I'm now gonna pop into the camera to make sure that that's all lined up with the path of the Super Simple Man. So the object path is animated correctly. And then once that's done, um, I use the exactly the same as last time. Uh, I've done rough my rough layers over that, and you can see how rough they are again. They really, really are rough. Um, it's just there to feel it out. So you'll see a bit of a kind of a time lapse type thing happening here now. Um, so yeah, just just working out those shapes, working out the, each individual keyframe with her uh, sliding on the floor, getting up, coming towards camera, and then eventually leaping over the barrels in the foreground. So this isn't within the camera, now it's within the camera. Um, you can kind of pop in and out of camera mode to not camera mode, depending on whatever works for you. So once that kind of rough is laid in then, and I'm happy enough with the flow of that, that feels good. Uh, then I'm popping in once again to make new layers and to start cleaning up the uh, the artwork for the cleanup layer. As you can see, I've set the uh, the other actual layers quite low in opacity um, so that I can clearly see the, the line work that I need to work on. Not too much visual interruption. And here's another time lapse of uh, the rest of the cleanup. Blender's got this really cool modifier. Um, I'll talk about modifiers at another point, but you can add this modifier to it that actually, it it's always seems to be always recording what 
order you draw things in. So you can add like a little time lapse thing to any of uh, to, to the grease pencil, and it will play it back to you in the order you actually drew it. Then I'm popping back in the camera to see how that all looks from within the angle that I've chosen, and it all looks nice and clean and in position. The contact points look close enough. Um, so yeah, that's all working there. Next thing in would be the the fills, and I've already done those. I'm not going to go through the one, one by one. Um, yeah, that's where it looks like Phil, so it stands out nicely across the back against the background. Um, so then we've got the other guy. So this is me pathing in the other guy who, who kind of runs after her and like shoots. She's, he's supposed to be shooting after her. Uh, and then we're in a different angle here. You can see the contact points on the floor. He's less developed than she is because he's way off in the background. And then this is the final image. So what we're doing here now, again, uh, like we did earlier, was, okay, so I've chosen those angles. I've worked it all out. The animation's all worked out but I still have all of the flexibility that I want to look for other camera angles to utilize for different cuts or to just alternatives. So this is one I've chosen here. It's a close up behind, coming from behind the barrel. So she slides into shot and I'm keyframing the camera so that it just eases out by the time that she's standing. And again, here's the final render. But, you know, we can go way further than that. We can pull right back. Let's see where it breaks. Let's pull right back and start slinging the camera around to see how well this holds up from multiple angles. It holds up pretty well there. When you're really high, obviously they look like cardboard cutouts. It's not gonna hold up great there, but that information is still valid. Those are 3D objects in 3D space. So that, that can be handed over to a layout team or it can be used as a plan view for a layout team. And you can even come right the way around to behind here. Obviously the artwork is backwards. We kind of, we should, we'd have to make new grease pencil layers on top of it in order to draw the detail on the back of them. But still, it still works, right? And you kind of, you can go all the way around it like this and just try and find interesting angles. It all still works. This level of flexibility before, during, and after the fact for a 2D air is incredible. It would mean that you could block out a scene you could just look for angles with the director. Bonus round, interpolation mode, difference between constant and linear. Okay, so linear by default uh, is what your object modes and animations and keyframes will be set at. So that means that it slides smoothly through the environment. Can you see the, because that's happening, you get the kind of the feet skating and this is where you get like previs skating man, yeah? So if you want to stop that and you want it to kind of pop, 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 pose to pose to pose, uh, to look, I personally think it looks more natural. You highlight all the keyframes, right click, interpolation mode, and then change the constant. It's got a little step symbol. And that means it just steps to each of the keyframes. Do, 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 do. You will have, actually have to make that happen in the object mode though. Um, so kind of line up your grease pencil layers and then add keyframes on your object mode and step those. As with everything, those two different modes can be used effectively for different things. Linear, for instance, is excellent if you want things to be flying around really smoothly or you or you do want something to be sliding down a hill or something like that. But I think uh, constant works really well when you've got foot to ground contact or you want something to really deliberately interact with a piece of environment. Example scene two. So now that we've laid out all the real fundamentals of how we do this kind of thing, um, I've got a couple of specific other ways I've tried and used uh, different approaches. So this example we're looking at now, uh, I used a particular approach to get to where we're at. Um, so as you'll see here, uh, you can see the way it's moving through the environment. It's difficult to see because we're so wide, uh, but you, if, you, if you squint or you zoom in, you can see the, the cameras and the objects moving around there in space. Um, so the way I blocked this one out is a little different to last time. I actually use a 3D object to block out the path of the creature, at least. The other guy wasn't. He was done the way we've, we've done so far. But I used a 3D guy, as you can see there, to animate him going across the, uh, the organic environment. Um, the reason I've done this, well, a number of reasons. The first is that sometimes it's really difficult, even with the best intentions and the technique we used previously, still can be quite difficult to know exactly where you are in 3D space when you work in through the camera. So having a 3D object within that 3D space for you to kind of anchor to and as even as just a visual reference um, is really useful because it really 
um, allows you to see exactly where you are in the space. But further to that, we can literally anchor to it as well. So in this example, I've actually used, uh, I've created a grease pencil layer and I've anchored it to the object in a process called parenting. So if you hold, if you select the uh, grease pencil object, hold shift and select the actual man who is already animated and then press control and P, um, the option to parent it will come up and then you, sh you choose parenting. I always choose parenting with transform and then that grease pencil layer will stick to the, um, the 3D man and wherever he goes, it goes. So now you don't have to worry about animating the grease pencil layer as an object right now. You've just parented it to an already animated 3D object. So in this sample, I've already done my kind of uber rough uh, grease pencil animations of the guy, of the uh, the creature. So now I've just hidden the the man, the 3D man. His geometry is all still there and we're still following his coordinates and everything. We're just not looking at him anymore. Another reason for using a 3D object like this is that you might be able to hand this information on then to another department or another department who uses different pieces of software because the grease pencil object may or may not translate. So you could you get savings handing over to layout then. So I'll just run through some the usual process video here now of it. Um, nothing unique to add to this one really other than the fact that it's tethered to a 3D object. The process of roughing, cleaning and filling was identical to the example that I've given already. Um, uh, we got a much more complicated environment and I've used the EV renderer, which I'll switch on. And you can see the lights kick in there for a bit of atmosphere, a bit of volumetric shading. I've added a bit of a rim light to the, to the creature there. You can do that manually in the grease pencil layer, or there's actually an effects tab where you can add a couple of different effects like glow. And one of them is rim light. So that's what I'm doing right now over on the right there. You can uh, kind of push a sort of fake rim light left or right, you can change the color of it. And then you can also add modifiers like hue, saturation, tint, to just play with the coloration. Um, in the new version of Blender, um, real-time lights in the 3D environment now affect grease pencil. So that's something I'm gonna explore in the future, but it's not something that's uh, actually active in the scene. Everything here is done via the uh, uh, the modifiers. So now we're focusing uh, the viewport over in real-time with EV. So you see all the lights and reflections and everything on the, uh, the little dude over here who's uh, sliding down and then kind of jumps up over the ledge. Again, this was done in exactly the same way as the demo I did earlier um, by doing a just a rough drawing and then pathing it, animating the object and then drawing the uh, the animation. So the rough layer is done there. Let me switch to the cleanup, kind of skip past all that, back into EV mode. So um, the grease pencil modifiers and effects, the effects at least only show up in in EV. So if you want the rim lighting, you're gonna have to use the EV renderer. So you can see here I am again now playing with the rim light. You can see how far you can push that. It basically just kind of creates a mask or like a duplicate of the silhouette and then makes it a different color. It's, it's, it's a cheat, but it, it's pretty effective. Change the color of it. Um, and again, then you can add other modifiers like hue saturation, play with those just to get the color balance you want. But uh, as I said, this uh, this new new system of lighting within Blender now is really exciting. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing with that. And so here are the final renders of this sequence, these two shots. Example scene three. So this one is a big um, five shot sequence. Uh, it's the longest sequence I've done. Uh, it was actually an earlier one that I did. So there's some cheating going on in places, but it's still got the most ambitious use of um, like a kind of moving object with a grease pencil on it that I've done today. Cause that shot there is legitimately, again, moving through 3D space. That particular one is not, it's not a cheat at all. Um, if you look at this now, and you look at the fly through, you'll see the entire sequence again, but with the big fat wide view there on the left where you can see all the cameras and you can see the object and you can see it's flying along and the camera's tracking it. So, um, yeah, this was a really interesting one to try and work out. So as we go around again, now I've gone in a little closer on each of the uh, left-hand views, so you can just kind of locate a little bit more where we are. So this second shot is um, 
that one's just basically a uh, flat canvas over the camera, the close-up that we saw. This one is, again, another cheat. So this one only actually works when you're looking through the camera angle. And once you're outside of it here, you can see it's all working on a on a flat plane. And it's only from the right projection that it actually works. Uh, this one is legitimate. This is a uh, the, the launch now into the dive, um, the gliding section, essentially. This is all legitimately in 3D space. So I was really happy when I worked this one out because this was what I was aiming for. I didn't want to have to cheat all the time. Um, it's totally legitimate to do that kind of panel in front of the plane, uh, in front of the camera technique when it works, but that's not what I was looking for. And so this was the first time I actually achieved this. Um, I'll show you exactly how I achieved that in a moment. So like the previous example, I used a 3D object to help out here, because especially when you're having someone fly through the air, it's really, diff really, really difficult then to know where the hell you are in 3D space if you don't have something to anchor you. So um, yeah, this is the same process I used though, right? So you just move along to wherever your next position on the timeline is, you press I, you create your keyframes, keep doing that until you've got the path. <laughs> So I've got a sort of front, middle and end pose here as an example of it. So we've got a bit of a dip, we've got a bit of an arc, which, um, so I've kind of lined up the viewport here and I've just to test the arc, see how that feels. Yep, it's good enough. So now we need to make a camera. So shift A camera, press number pad zero to be inside the camera. We've done all this before, same process, but this is a little bit different now. So I'm not gonna keyframe this camera. Right? So because I've already animated him moving through the environment and I wanna track him, I'm actually going to create what's called a constraint. So with your camera object selected, on the right-hand side there, look for the constraint icon. It's like a big wheel and a small wheel tethered. Go to Add and then Track To. With the little eyedropper, click that and then click your Super Simple Man or whoever you've used, whatever object you've used. It'll kind of pop in really weird here. Change the settings as shown here to minus Z and Y respectively in those brackets. And now you can see that the camera just follows, it keeps him centered and follows the object. So now I've kind of, now I've actually chosen the uh, super simple man object again, and I'm pushing him around, changing his position because I want to do a bigger arc with him now. But as you can see, the camera is always staying centered on him. So I'm not touching the camera at all here. I'm just touching the object, moving him around, and the camera just keeps looking at it. The next step here is to create a grease pencil. So a grease pencil layer. So if we use our cursor to um, go on the surface of the object and then create the grease pencil, it'll, that's where it'll be created. Switch on all the canvases, and then uh, we're going to start drawing in a moment. Uh, remember to shift, remember to press tab and then switch back to drawing mode. And then zoom in to a more comfortable position and we can start going. So settings here now, because we've chosen our camera angle, choose origin in the first setting and then view in the second. This is because we've chosen our camera and we're comfortable with it. And it also means that it'll always be on the origin, it'll always be on the object, but it'll always be facing the camera. So just start drawing, start roughing out your, your basic like first pose essentially here now. And then we need to parent it to the object. I probably should have done this a little sooner. So if we select the pencil object, hold um, hold shift, click the the proxy object, control P parent, just like we did before. And now you'll see that as before, everywhere the object moves, the grease pencil object moves too. And so you can just go through now and start drawing in your different keyframes. So what you'll find is it kind of holds all right for a little while and then once it gets to a certain point in the uh, like the rotation of the object, it'll look, look weird. So that's where you need to draw your new keyframes. This is exactly how I did uh, the scene with the wingsuit dive. I just kept going, you just keep going now until you're happy with it. Here's a short time lapse of uh, the roughing process and then the cleanup process. So once all your layers are done, your animation, your cleanup, your fills, you're done. And that's the that's how we get here. That's how we get to this kind of uh, hybrid workflow. The next thing then I'm going to talk about, the last thing of this sequence, 
um, is how we switch from camera to camera. So in this sequence, we've got a total of five cameras. I'll just show you how to switch between two. So if you look on the left here, you'll see that as it gets down to that point, it switches to the next camera. So um, that's done by making markers on the timeline. Now, Blender actually does have a camera sequencer, like a video editor type thing, but I'm, I haven't learned that yet, so I can't teach you that. But I can teach you the way I did this. So I'm going to assume that you've set up any cameras you want and need throughout the sequence. So like I, I did, I had the multiple cameras set up and everything. And then you need to decide where you want those to cut. So something I would also advise is up on the top right hand side of the um, the viewport, the, uh, the, the options, I can't remember what they call it, like the controller or something. Up there, there's a search bracket. If you type camera, then it'll get rid of everything else but your camera and only show your cameras. That'll make it really easy for you to uh, navigate and, and find <clears throat> the cameras that you want to use. Okay, so back to the scene now and I'll demonstrate how I switch the cameras over where I want it. So on the timeline here, you can see I've, I've at a certain point and I want to create a marker here, which is where I want to switch over. So I press M and that little icon came up at the bottom there. So now I want to make sure that the camera I want to switch to is selected. In this case, it's camera three. And then once that's <clears throat> once that's established, you go to um, the marker option, and then you go down to bind camera to marker, and you will see that the naming of that camera icon or the marker is actually bound to a camera. And so you'll stick in that camera until you do another marker on the timeline. So that's what I'm doing. Now I'm moving to the point where I want to switch to the next camera and I'll make another marker, and then I'll do the same thing again. I'll go to marker, and then bind to camera. Now, it switches to that point. <clears throat> so as we scrub through, we're in camera three right now. We scrub through, and as soon as it hits that marker, it'll switch to the new camera. Oop, there we are, we're in camera four there, for the remainder. And that's how you do it. Example scene four. The purpose of this exercise was for me to find out whether I could actually uh, import 3D animation from uh, Mixamo specifically, is what I used, and rotoscope over the top of it to see if that actually works within 3D space. So not tracing over the top of, uh, say, a flat image, actually um, tracing over to rotoscope on a grease pencil that's attached to a 3D object. One of my motivations for doing this is sometimes in my job, um, a project might have gone into layout or previs or rough and rough animation. And then they find that they need a bit more information that's easier to come from 2D. And sometimes you have to kind of go over the top of some rough animation. So I thought, well, it might be really interesting if we could actually do that live in the, in the space. And so the animators then have the, um, the drawn version of the adjustment running alongside uh, their animation. So you can do this with any existing 3D animation or any new animation you've created. I used Mixamo because I wanted to grab something quickly. It's a great resource for uh, lots of standardized animations that you'll see a lot of. You can choose different characters as you've seen here, different skins. When you're happy, you just go to download and then uh, make sure it's got the animation and, and the, uh, the skin, download it and import it into Blender. File, import, FBX, locate your file, import the file, So there it is in the viewport, zoom in so you can see a little better. As you can see on the timeline at the bottom there, there are a bunch of keyframes. You scrub through, you can see the animation is working. So that means you're imported in. You need to lay this out in the environment how you want it. I'm not going to do that here. You can see how I've laid it out in the scene. And if you want really detailed tutorials about laying 3D out animation out, uh, there are other tutorials for that. So here's a bunch of animations that I've imported into the various shots, stitch them together. Uh, to lay out the animation I wanted. So now we're in here, let's pause it about here and let's start adding in our grease pencil so that we can start rotoscoping. Okay. So as before, uh, I select the object and then create, uh, put the cursor on the object and then create the new grease pencil layer. You can see the canvas is already activated here. So I'll go straight into draw mode and get busy. Always remember to parent the grease pencil object to the object you're tracing off. So once I've made a few strokes here now, and that's enough to identify where my grease pencil layer is, I popped out of the camera, 
What I would advise doing when this rotoscoping kind of thing is to go back into object mode now for your grease pencil and just push it, pop it slightly off on the axis towards wherever your camera direction is. So it's just kind of sitting just over the object. Um, that's just going to make it a bit easier. You're always going to have that that nice clarity between the objects. Sometimes it can kind of get a bit clippy um, because you've got moving parts, arms swinging around and everything. So I'm looking for some optimal viewport settings at the moment. So I've jumped into the 2D animation mode, 2D animation tab at the top there. I've just switched off a few settings. Um, switching, playing with the kind of the fade of the, the objects. It's a little tricky when you've got 3D because by default, sometimes this X-ray thing is on. So if you switch that off in the, in the drop-down tab, there got matte caps nice for, for going over 2D, uh, 3D. Uh, switch the X-ray off because it gets really busy. So now we're gonna got a nice clear viewport and start uh, rotoscoping over this. So you just get busy now. You just start rotoscoping. It's fairly simple. You got the reference right in front of you. Just draw over it. Uh, you see this kind of black, just dark light flickering that happens constantly. This is, seems to be a new feature in Blender. Whenever you make a stroke, it makes it, everything goes darker or lighter, depending on whether you're making a stroke or not. I don't know how to switch that off. So if anyone knows how to switch it off, please let me know because it gets on my nerves a bit. So, you know, your your character might not look like exactly like the character you brought in. Probably won't. So maybe we have a cape. So draw any cape, draw your extra bits, make, make, it, looks like it, make it look like your character. Uh, move along to your next keyframe, start tracing that out. There's the cape again. Uh, start tracing in the character, add in whatever details are relevant, and then just keep going. Uh, keep rotoscoping to your heart's desire. So we're done with this sample, and you can hide then the 3D, the 3D animation object and you're just left with the 2D. So once more, then you can see the, um, the results of that, uh, the rotoscoping running alongside the original animation. Uh, we're using, the, again, the camera sort of uh, cuts like we did in the previous example. Uh, I want to take the note, uh, take a moment here to say that the scaffold that I've built here is actually, uh, I didn't build the objects, I laid it out from a kit that was from um, Blender swap. I will link the uh, the artist and the kit in the description. Everything else in these videos is 100% made by me. So that's the end of this big fat tutorial. Um, I hope it's covered enough of the things that you're interested in. Hopefully you'll learn a lot. If you want to um, follow me or keep in contact with me, just uh, follow me on social media. I have an Instagram account, which is Spitfire Storyboards. I have a website, which is www.spitfirestoryboards. I have a LinkedIn account and I have a Vimeo account as well. And this YouTube channel that you'll probably be watching this on. So uh, yeah, feel free to follow, like, subscribe and comment in the sections. And I will uh, do my best on YouTube and Instagram to respond to any queries. And I uh, hope to do another one in the future. Bye.